Hello and welcome to uh, this week's uh, Bible school from uh, New Life. Um, and uh, as you probably noticed, last week we had winter vacation, but now we are back, back in business. And um, this, uh, this week we're going to start a new uh, topic about the end of times. Uh, and uh, I'm going to teach now for the next three weeks about different um, subtopics uh, under the uh, topic of um, end of times. So, uh, and today we're going to look at the times that we are living in and, and look at the different signs that we are actually in the end of times. Uh, or at least in the uh, very proximity of it. So, I um, hope you will, uh, will uh, get something out of this. It's, it's a message that God put very strongly on my heart for, for like, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and, and called me to write a book about it. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, I will share some of that, of course. Um, uh, of course, not everything. We do not have time for that. But I will try to give you some some uh, highlights uh, from from that teaching. And um, so today, actually, it's it's uh, uh, the signs of the times. And uh, let's just start because I, as usually, have a lot on my heart. So know the times. Um, Let's go to Matthew 16. Because you know, Jesus is, um, is teaching about this subject uh, in, uh, at least you can find it in Luke, Math Matthew, and also in Mark. Uh, and, and we're going to look at what he says here in Mark. And, and uh, Mark 1, uh, Mark 16, and Verse 1. Now when the Sabbath uh, was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that might come. No, oh, I'm mean, in totally wrong uh, uh, gospel here. It was Matthew 16. I thought it was something strange about this. So Matthew 16 and verse 1. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him about, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be a foul weather to get today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. So here we see Jesus is rebuking both the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they could not read the sign of the time. They could not read the times that they were living in. And you know, of course, uh, their, their major mistake was to not recognize that Jesus actually were the Messiah they were all longing for. And of course, that is, is, is um, their, of course, biggest mistake and, and, and also uh, shows us that they actually was totally blind for the time that they were living in. Because, of course, the most important thing in that time was that Jesus came as the Messiah to the earth. And, and uh, if you do not recognize that, then of course you are totally blind for the time. And, and so, so and, and you know, he is also saying to us that we have to see what time we are living in. We should not be like the Sadducees or the Pharisees that, that could uh, interpret, you know, the weather and, and uh, you know, be so caught up, you know, in the small things of the daily life. It's, it's very easy to do that. 
It's very easy to, to be so preoccupied with what you are doing in your daily life, with your work or whatever, with, with the, your family, or, or maybe you are building something in a house or whatever, and you get so, so extremely caught up in it that you, can, you do not lift up your eyes and look at what is happening around you. And, and the signs that, that is, is, uh, is in the earth, in the, in the world, you know, and in the church, just pass us by because we are not, uh, we are not uh, uh, observant, we are, we are preoccupied with, with our things, and we miss the signs. And Jesus says, we have to be a people that recognize the signs and understand the times. And let's go to First Chronicles, uh, Chronicles, um, and uh, chapter twelve. Du må trykke på den, 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 den ja, det, nei, jeg skal vise deg. Er det Ja. Du må gjøre det for hver gang du skifter. Uh, yeah, let's go to First Chronicles and chapter 12 and verse 32. And there it says about uh, a tribe of Israel. Let me see. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, that chief were 200 uh, and their brethren were uh, at their command. Here it says that the, the sons of Israel, or the, the children of Issachar, knew the time. And by knowing the time, they knew what Israel ought to do in the times. And that is also how God wants us to be. We are supposed to know what time we are living in. Jesus says that we should not be ignorant, we should not be sleeping so that the day when he comes, comes like a thief for us. No, we should be awake and we should be sober so that the day when he comes does not come as a thief in the night for us. That doesn't mean that we have, uh, have complete knowledge about exact the day and so on. No, but we should know the time. We should know that his coming is at hand, and we should then prepare. Because that is what Jesus is calling us to, to be ready in the times that we are living in. So, let's go to Luke 21. And look for where we're going to see this signs. In Luke 21 and verse 29. Uh, there it says, Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourself that the summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. As surely I say to you, this generation will not by no means pass away till all the things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. Okay, so here we see Jesus saying that we should first of all look at the fig tree. What is the fig tree? That is Israel. Uh, the fig tree is a, is a symbol for Israel, and, and, but he 
so, so of course, we should look at Israel to, to see what God is doing with the nation and with the people. And by that, we're going to see what time we are living in. Because when the fig tree is uh, budding, then we should know that the time is at hand when Jesus is coming back. But then he also says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. So that means that it's not only in Israel we're going to see the signs. No, there is also other trees that we're going to look at. And what are these trees? There's three major places where we can see the signs of the time. That is, first of all, in Israel. And then secondly, it is in the church, the church of God. There you will see signs of the time. And, the second, and thirdly, it is in the world. So it is in these three areas, we're going to see the signs of what time we are living in. And we're going to look at the different signs that we can find in these three areas. So, um, let's continue here. Trycker du på den så att det Uh, so, uh, the signs in God's church. And let's go first of, you know, for all uh, in, in Acts 3. And uh, verse 19. This is a very important sh- uh, uh, part here uh, and uh, in, in different things, but of course it also s- is speaking about uh, the signs in the church. Then it says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out so that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Okay, here we see that heaven is holding Jesus back. He, heaven is, 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 is the place where Jesus is until the time of the restoration of all things have been done. And and all these things that that God has spoken about his church through the prophets are going to be restored. Everything that God spoke about, the church is going to be restored. And, And of course, the word restore can only mean one thing, and that is that it has been, it is not, but it's going to be restored. You cannot restore something that has never been. So it had to be sometime, and then it had been going away, and then it's going to be restored. That is the whole concept of restoration. So here, here it is, you know, the, there's times of restoration. So it's not one time, but it's several times. And and actually the word, the Greek word that is used here is is, is kairos, which means opportune time, means appointed time. And and, and that means that God have have in, in the history, in the time, put in different periods where his his having a time of restoration. And what can we see when we look back at the church history? We see this very clearly. We see that for the first 300 years, approximately, a lot of things happened in the church. Uh, and, and, you know, the apostles and, and all the disciples and stuff like went out and preached the gospel, and the gospel was preached in all the known world. 
and a lot of people got saved. You know, in, in Rome itself, approximately one million uh, was in the inhabitants of Rome at that time. And they say that uh, by counting the, the graves in the catacombs uh, that had Christian markings, they could say that in the first generation of Christians in, in Rome, it was approximately 250,000. So one-fourth of Rome, the city of Rome, was saved at that time. And, and you know, you can read a lot of Roman uh, letters at that time, and they are complaining to the emperor about all these Christians that is totally turning upside down our, uh, our community. And, 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 and it's, it's, the Christianity was not a small thing in a corner. No, it was massive. And a lot of people got saved. And, you know, this is how true Christianity was supposed to be. So there you have everything that God has spoken through the prophets was active in that time. The apostles and, and, and all the other Christians was functioning in the fullness of what God had for the church. But then, you know, to be able to get to a time of restoration... This had to go away. And that it did. In the year of 325, Constantine had a meeting, you know, where he called all the church leaders uh, to himself in Nicaea, and, and, and they, they made some rules for the church. And one of the rules was, there's not allowed to have any more house churches. Up till then, it had been only house churches. But then he, he uh, abolished the, the, the house churches and instead said, no, we're going to have these basilicas. We're going to have this, this big meeting and we're going to have one priest conducting a service for the people. And, and, and so, so all this, this life that had been in the church up till then, where everyone was, everyone was in function. You know, if you, can re if you read um, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 27, you see that Paul is saying that, how is the brethren when you get together? Then one of you have a psalm, one of you have a teaching, one of you have... So it's, it's a lot of life in the church. Everyone was in a function. And that is how God was intending the church to be. It was intended to be a body in function. But then, you know, Constantine came and he didn't like this, 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 this organism that was totally out of control. No, he wanted control. He wanted to, to be able to govern this. So he set some boundaries, some rules, and you know, the life in the church just died. And instead of the Holy Spirit's power and life, you know, we, they got instead riches and power, you know, political power, and they got status, you know. So, so the, whole, the whole church that that the apostles knew about just died. And, and, and then, you know, God started to restore. He sent these times of restoration, these kairoses of restoration. And it started with John Knox, an English theologian, that, that just found from the, sh from the scriptures salvation through faith. And you know, this went on to Jan Hus and to Martin Luther and, and all the other uh, reformists in, in, in the Reformation. And from there on, you know, we got uh, John Wesley, we got the Baptists, and then we got the Pentecostals, you know, it just went on and on and on. And God took time of restoration, times of restoration. He took one truth by us and, and just 
put back into the church. Up until now, when we have the last things that we have seen been rest, restored into the church, in the ministry of the prophet in, in 1980s uh, upwards, and the ministry of the apostle from 2000 upward. Uh, and, and, you know, God is doing this so that he can create back the church that he was speaking about when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And, and, you know, in Ephesians 5, and we have to rush on here. It's, it's, this is it's so much on my heart, so I could stand here and preach for you about this all day, but uh, uh, we have to get on to, to um, what we're actually going to preach about. Um, so, but Ephesians 5 and 25, uh, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And then it comes, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is what God is doing in the church at the time. He is making his, his son's bride, you know, into this perfect bride, full of his glory, full of his power. That is what God is longing to present to Jesus. He is longing to present the church as this, this blemish, this, this, uh, this, this sh church without any blemish, this, this totally perfect and, and, and glorified church. That is what God is doing in this time. And how does he do it? By, you know, restoring things after things. Truth after truth. And, and in, in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, you know, in verse 28, And God has appointed to the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, uh, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, various of tongues. And, and, you know, this is how God first put it in. No, he first started with the apostles and prophets and so on. And then he took all the, the things that it says there in that order. Chrono in, in, that, um, in that timeline. But now it's, it's when he's restoring, it is in the opposite direction. If you, if you notice, if you see in the... In the, in the in the church history, you will see that God has taken the same list, but just the opposite direction. And started, you know, in 1901 with the, the tongues, you know, and then it came the healing revivals in the 1940s, and then it came, you know, the teachers in, in the 1970s, and the prophets in the, in, the, in the 1980s, and then the apostles in the 2000s. But what he is doing now is that he is restoring the church back to the original. Because these things were put into the church. Not so that only the apostles should function as an apostle. Or that the prophet should function as an apostle, the prophet or teacher and so on. You know? That was not the, the main goal. No. The main goal was that by God putting them into the church, the church should become the, the perfect church that God had in his heart. And that is also the goal for the restoration of all things. That the church should become this perfect church, this holy and without blemish and, and, and this, this perfect bride for Jesus Christ. That we should grow up so that we can receive the fullness of Christ in the church. That is the goal of God's restoration of everything. 
So when we now see that God has, is, is in the end of that list. He has started to restore the, the apostles, you know. And, and we see different apostles stand up and, and start to become, uh, get the, the, the place that they need and, 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 and get into the function. And the church has started to, to understand how the apostles are supposed to function. So, so that means that we are in the end here. But now it is just the church that needs to be restored back to the original, back to how it was in the start, when the church was full of his power, when the church were a place where everyone was, was in function. That is what God is doing. So that is a big sign in the church that God had been doing this restoration, this work of restoration. The next thing we see in the church is, is the harvest year, the, the, the cycles of the harvest year. And we go to Matthew 13. And verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and uh, sowed tears among the weed and went his way. But when the grain uh, had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tears also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How does it have tears? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to, them, to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while uh, you gather up the Tears you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then we jump to, to uh, verse 36, where, he's, where Jesus is explaining this parable. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tears and of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. But the tears are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and uh, the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as tears are gathered and bounded, uh, in the fire, uh, burned in the fire, it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wavering and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the, as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so, so here we see Jesus is saying that, that the, 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 the whole harvest, in a way, from when he sowed his word into the, into the earth, when he walked on the earth, you know, and preached the gospel, until the end of time, when the harvest is supposed to be. It's like a year in Israel, the harvest year of Israel. And you can also find that in, in Jacob uh, 5, uh, 7, and 8. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it says that, the, the farmer should be patient and wait for both the early rain and the latter rain. And that is, is how the, the year of Israel is. 
the harvest year of Israel is, is, is starts, you know, when they sow the word, and they sow the seed in the ground, you know, and then it comes a time of raining. It's the early rain. And then it comes a long period of drought. And then just before they're going to harvest it, it's again a time of rain, the latter rain. And then it's the time of harvest. And here Jesus is saying that this is how it's also going to be when he is, when we look at the whole church history. It's like this, this year of harvest in Israel. And also Jake, uh, James is saying the same in, in, in James 5 and uh, verse, chapter 5 and verse 7 and 8. You know, and, and when we look at the history of the church, this is exactly what we see. You know, as, as I also said about when we, when we s talked about the restoration of times. You know, in the first, you know, Jesus sold his word and then it came a time of raining, the, the, the early rain with the apostles and, and up to approximately 300, you know, it was raining. And, and the Holy Spirit's power was functioning in the church. And then there came a long period of drought. And, and it didn't start to rain before approximately 1900. When, you know, the first one that got baptized was Agnes Osman, from, that, that got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and from there on it spread to Azusa Street with the... With, with, uh, William Seymour and so on, and, and, and you know, the, the, the Pentecostal movement, the, the revival of the Pentecostals just spread over the whole church, the ho whole earth, you know, and, and, uh, and it has been raining since then, you know, the Holy Spirit is raining still, you know, and, and we are still, you know, in functioning in the Holy Spirit's power. So we are in the time of the latter rain. And, and what does Zechariah says that we're going to do in that time? We are going to pray for rain on every man's field so that every man shall have fruit on their field. So that is how we're going to do it now. And, and you know, uh, and then, you know, the next period in that harvest year is the harvest time. It is not coming any more drought. No, the next thing that is going to happen is harvest. And you know, I'm so looking forward to when we actually come into the harvest season. You know, everything that we have been harvesting of souls up till now is, is you know, off season in a way. So just wait for it when we are actually entering into the harvest season when everything is reap everything is is ready for 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 harvest we're going to see such multitudes be saved in that time and i'm so looking forward to it the next sign that we can see in the church is that there is is two streams in the church. It's a, two parallel streams. Uh, and let's go to uh, Second Thessalonican, Thessalonican, um, chapter two and verse three. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that, uh, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and, that, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of uh, perdiction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
do not uh, do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things and now uh, you know how how uh, and now you know what is restraining that he might be res revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of, lawless, uh, of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, signs and lying wonders. Okay, so, and let's go to uh, 2 Timothy 3. And verse 1. But now this, that in the last days perilous time will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, and a great unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying it, its power. And from such people turn away from, for of this sort are those who kept, uh, creep into households and make captives of, uh, of uh, gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always leaning, learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as uh, Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, uh, so do these also res res resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds uh, disapproved concerning the faith, but they will uh, progress no further, for the folly with, uh, will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. And we also take with us uh, chapter 4 and verse 2. Preach the word, be ready in, uh, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because uh, they have itching ears, they will heap up from the, for themselves teachers, and they will turn uh, their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables but you uh, be watchful in all things endure afflictions do do the work of an evangelist uh, fulfill your ministry okay so here we have three three passages that it's talking about how it's going to be in the end of times and and first we read that there is going to be a falling away. Uh, and, and, and then we read how these fallings, falling away is going to look. And, and in, in, in chapter 3 in 2 Timothy, we read that they're going to be, be ungodly, they're going to be unholy and so on, and, and, and lovers of their, their lusts more than lovers of God. And it said... And they're going to have an outer look of holiness, but uh, not, um, uh, do not, uh, what it says, um, uh, 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 yeah, having a form of godliness, but, but denying its power. So it's, it's like they, they look like they are Christians, they look like they are godly, but 
they are lacking the power. It's like they, they only have, you know, the religious looking. They, is, they are like the, the Pharisees, you know, that, that love to stand in the temple, you know, and pray loud prayers so everyone should hear them, have these, you know, robes and so on. So everyone should look how holy they are, how perfect they are, you know. But, but they are not interested actually in the Holy Spirit's power. They're not interested in the Holy Spirit's working on their inner man, you know. They are not interested in the character of God. They are not interested in, in either the true life of God. They are more interested in, you know, that should be, you know, perfect everything, the perfect music, the perfect everything, you know. But the Holy Spirit is not there. The Holy Spirit is, 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 they are not interested in. And you know, sadly, we, we can say that some of this we already see. You know, we, we have secret sensitive churches that are so good in everything they do. But the Holy Spirit is, is never allowed to do what he is doing, you know. So we, we never see any, any, in any spiritual gifts in function. And, and there is, you know, a very strict program and no place where the Holy Spirit can come and, and do his work. I don't say that every church that is doing it like that is, is like that. But, but some are, some of the extreme ones are. And, 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 <clears throat> and then we, we see the next, you know, is that they, they're going to heap up themselves, teachers that teach the things that each is the air, you know, and, and they're going to listen and listen and listen, but never come to the truth because they are listening to the wrong pe preachers. They are listening to the preachers that are only preaching lawlessness. And, and preaching, you know, uh, uh, some, some other kind of gospel. And, and this we can also find, you know, there is different uh, teachings that have been coming, you know. For instance, you know, we have this, this, this eternal security teaching that says that, okay, if you have been saved once, you can do whatever. You can swear that you do not believe in Christ anymore. And still you are saved. That is how they say it. Because they think that once saved, you always are saved. So, so and of course, if you read the, the, the Bible in its, its totality, you will see that these things are not according to the scripture. It's, it's, you cannot take one scripture and build the whole theology on one scripture. And then if you find some scriptures that are troublesome in your system, then you have to bend them, you know. Or maybe this is not before the... They, they are before the cross and so on, you know. It's a lot of things that have been done just to, to try to get them their system into how it's... In, in, in the, what we find in the Bible. But, uh, you know, it's a sum. It's a sum of the Lord's word that it's the truth. So you have to ha take the whole package. You cannot take only one or two scriptures or some favorite scriptures and, and build your whole theology on it. No, you have to take the whole package to see that God, God's word is often both ways, you know. It's... it's very seldom just one thing, but it's often different things that are balancing it's, it's, it, it are, it's itself up, in a way. So this is some of the God, of the word that is truth. Okay. And we, we see these things already, especially here in the West, uh, and, and, and uh, so important when we see these things that we flee away from them. And, and of course, one big sign 
is what Jesus says when he is speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. He says that, and the gospel of is going to be preached in the whole earth, and then the end will come. So that is a big sign, you know, that the gospel is being preached everywhere. I don't know if we are totally yet there, but we are getting there. And, and, and God is still just sending out missionaries. He is he's sending, calling uh, people out into the mission fields to, to see that every place on earth is going to hear the gospel. And, and, and of course, it is it's before the end. And the end is, you know, after the tribulation. So this might also, you know, be, be, be fulfilled in the tribulation's time. But, but at least it's going to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back. <clears throat> okay, so these, these things are signs in the church. But now let's go and look at the signs in Israel. And of course, the biggest sign of all is the nation of Israel. And look, let's go to Luke 21 again. And chapter 20. Uh, uh, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that the desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of here depart. And let those who are in the country enter. Uh, um, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written might be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are uh, nursing babies in those days, for there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will be fall uh, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away captive into the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, this we know happened in, year, in the year 70 after Christ. The Romans besieged Jerusalem and General Titus, he, he conquered Jerusalem, he burned it down and one million Jews were slain there. And, you know, the temple was rise to the ground, and, and they carried away uh, the riches of the temple. And, and uh, <clears throat> so this, this happened, you know. And, and then it's, Jesus is continuing and saying that, that, that the, the people is going to be led away in captivity. So, so those that were not killed there, they was led away. And actually it was so bad, you know, that the emperor uh, Vespasian, I think it was, uh, he said that no Jew is going to live more than three in each place. So he, he tried to destroy the, the, the people totally by splitting them and sending them to different nations and different places. So in one place, there should not be more than three ones, Jews. So, so he tried to destroy the, the, the Jewish people totally by dispersing them, you know. But God... God's hand was upon the people. He knew who was his people and who was not, you know. And so he, he preserved them and, and they grew. And, and, but still, you know, in the nations, they were persecuted so much, you know. And, 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 and they had programs against them. They had the inquisition against them. They had a lot of anti-Semitism. And, you know, it, and even Luther, you know, he said, let's burn down every synagogue. So, so it, it was like the Christians also was so much against the Jews. And, and even though God says that you should bless 
Israel. You should bless Jerusalem. And, 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 uh, and you know, it, it, it all culminated, you know, with the, 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 the Holocaust where six million Jews were killed by the, by the Germans. And, and, uh, and, and then, you know, God started to restore the nation. And, and that is, is such a great uh, sign. And it it's, it's shows how extremely accurate God is. And I'm going to show you something that you might be not have seen before. And, and let's go to first to Ezekiel 4. And we're going to take our calculator and start to do some math here. Because in Ezekiel 4, it says, from verse 1, here God is talking to the prophet Ezekiel about the judgment of Jerusalem. And he says, You also, son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray it as a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it. Set camps against it also, and place battering rams against it all around. Moreover, take yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the household of Israel. Lay also on your left side and lay the iniquities of the houses of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you, shall, that you lay on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days, so you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And then you, uh, uh, and when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. 40 days, I have led uh, on you a day for each year. Okay. And then we also read in, in, in Deuteronomy, no, in Levit Leviticus, it is, in the third book of Moses. Uh, in, in, in chapter 26 and verse 18. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Okay, here we see God is measuring up his judgment upon Israel and upon Judah. And, and we're going to turn this page because here we're going to do a little bit math. We know that, okay, he says 390 years for Israel and 40 years for Judah. That means it's... Uh, 430 years altogether. But now both were in captivity in 70 years in Babylon, which was part of that judgment. So if you take away those 70 years, you have then 360 years left of judgment from God. And then we read in, in Leviticus that if you do not you know, obey me after all this judgment, I will multiply your judgment with seven. So then we take these 360 years, multiply it with seven, and we get 2,520 years. And you know, the biblical years are moon years, not sun years as we do, but moon years, and they have 360 days. So that means 2,520 years times 360 days, that brings us to 907 
1,200 days altogether. Okay, and then we know that the captivity of Babylon, which were the first part of the judgment, ended in the year of 536 before Christ in the spring. In the spring of 536, the, the proclamation of King Ka uh, Cyrus went out and the captivity ended. So, so here we have this, this date, you know. And then we take these 907,200 days and we divide it with our years, which are 365.25, which is one year. And we know how we have this extra day each four year. Uh, and, and then we have 365.25. And then we get 4,483.8 of our calendar years. Okay, and the big marvelous thing about God is how accurate he is. Because when you take these 2,483.8 years from the year 536 before Christ, what year do you end up in? You end up in 1947.8. Okay, 0.8 years after the spring, should end up approximately like 29th of November, 1947, which is the exact date when the, the vote in the United Nations voted in that Israel is getting back their country. God is so accurate. He is doing it on the exact day when he says the judgment is over. He is giving them their back, the country. So the Jews got their country back is such a big sign from heaven, both about God's existence, but also that now is with the end of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles are ended, you know. And that means that we're going to enter into the things that are acquainted to the end of time. So, yeah, we have been reading some here. And, and yeah, we can read from Isaiah. Let's see here. Read from Isaiah 35. And verse 1. The wilderness of the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the ex excellence of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of God, the excellency of God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the fable knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense uh, of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap with the f like deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The uh, parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the, he in the habitants, he habitation of jackals, where each lay there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Yeah, we can stop there. What, what God is also prophesying is when he, he's giving back the, the land to the, to the Jews, you know, it shall start to be 
so blessed. His favor is going to again be upon, upon the land. And if you go back to Israel, if you, re, if you go to Israel now, you will see that the land is so fruitful. It's so blessed by God. But if you read the, the, uh, a journey, uh, a, uh, a traveler's journey written by Mark Twain around 1900, he's going through Palestine, through Israel, and he is saying, this land is a desert. This land is totally waste. Nobody can live here. It's just stones and, and wilderness. So it's like from the day when the Jews got the land back, the blessing of God had come upon the land again. What, just as we read here. And that is also a great sign. And of course, we have the Exodus 2. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 16, in verse 14, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall, shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send you many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them and afterward I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rock. Okay. So this exodus too, this, you know, gathering of the Jews from the different nations where they had been sent out, you know, is also a great sign of the times. And, and, you know, we know, we see it ha has been so many coming home from Russia and all, from every nation where they have been sent. But it, then it says, first it's going to be fishermen so that will fish them, you know, come, come back to the nation, come back to Israel. But then God will send hunters uh, that will drive them out. And, and, and you know, this, this sounds like there is going to be a new persecution, new, new, new uh, uh, anti-Semitism around in the nations. And, and if you read uh, what a Jewish uh, community, uh, Jewish organization called the Anti-Defamation uh, League is saying is that over the last 10 years in Europe especially, the, the incidence of hate against Jews, hate crimes against Jews have been multiplied so much. So we see already there is it's a growing anti-Semitism and there is a growing you know, uh, hostility towards Israel. And we see it in our own country. We have, have, have different political parties that want to, to, you know, to, to boycott Israel and to, you know, it's, it's, it's always, you know, giving, taking every opportunity to just put Israel down. And, and uh, so, so this is something that God has been speaking about. It's a sign, you know. So, so if we had had this time when, when the fishermen is, you know, uh, calling them back to, to Israel, we're going to see there is also coming a time when, when they're going to be pushed out. And because God is wanting them back to Israel for what he's going to do in the time that is laying ahead. Yeah, we, we cannot take everything here, but one major thing get, that is going to be a major sign of the times is the restoration of the temple of, uh, of Israel, a, a reconstruction actually. 
Because, you know, in, in Matthew 24, Jesus is saying that Antichrist, he will set himself in the temple in the middle of the week, in the middle of the, the, the seven years that we call the Great Tribulation. He will proclaim himself God and set himself in the temple. And, you know, he cannot sit in a temple if there is no temple. So that means it's going to be a res restoration, uh, not a restoration, but a, a reconstruction of the temple. And, and actually, uh, you know, the, the, the second intifada, uh, the second rebellion of the, of the Palestinians started in, in 2011, I think it was. Um, no, 2001, actually. Uh, when a group of Orthodox Jews tried to put down the cornerstone of the new temple on the Temple Mount. Uh, in the meanwhile, you know, there is a lot of uh, Israeli in, in researchers that have found out that, oh, maybe the temple was not on the Temple Mount, that, that actually the, the Temple Mount is the place of the Roman fortress, and the temple was laying a little bit on the side, uh, and, and therefore maybe it's, it's going to be possible to build without doing anything about uh, last, the, uh, the two mosques that are on the Temple Mount now. So, so and actually uh, in 2013, it was 30% and increasing the support in Israel for building a new temple. So this is something that is on the heart of the Jews to, to build a new temple. And they have gathered everything. They have even ash from the, the, the offering places of the old temple that have been kept, you know, so they can, can uh, take the old ash into the new fire so that it should be like a continuous fire from, from the, the first temples. So, <clears throat> and then, okay, let's go and look at the signs in the world. And of course, we have uh, what it says in, in, in uh, Romans 8. Just to speed up a little bit here so we get approximately in time. Romans 8. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected uh, to uh, fertility not willingly, but because of him who subject, uh, subjected it uh, in hope. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberation of the children of God. Yeah. Um, here actually it's, it's, it's talking about that the creation itself are in, in labor pains. That, that uh, until, you know, the, the sons of God are revealed, you know, and, and the new earth is being birth, birthed out, you know, it's going to be labor pains in, 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 the, in the creation. And, you know, if, if, you, look at, if you look at any news, uh, maybe not every day, but at least once a week, you will f see some news about, you know, that the, the creation is in, in turmoil. They talk about, you know, this, this uh, you know, pollution and, and, uh, and uh, carbon uh, uh, dioxide and, you know, everything, you know, uh, that is, is, is overheating. They talk about, you know, uh, this this uh, global warming and stuff, and all these things that they, they are you know before in in 
times before us, you know, it was the preachers, you know, that was talking about doomsday. But now it's not the preachers. They don't dare to preach about doomsday anymore. No, no, it is the, the, those that are, you know, the, the, the scientists that are, are looking at the climate and so on. They are the doomsday prophets at this time. Because the creation is in labor pains. And that is a sign of the time. Because, you know, when, when do you have labor pains? It's bef before the birth, of course. And they are actually increasing until the time of birth. You know, wh when, when I had my sons, I didn't feel any pains, but, but, but uh, of course, my wife did. Uh, and, 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 and they, you know, increased until the time of birth. And, and that is also how it's going to be in the creation. The creation will f feel this labor pains because God is birthing for something new. So, so these things are a big sign of the time. The things that we see in the nature. And then let's go to Haggai. Two, we jump over all these other scripture there. Uh, you can write, read them later if you want. Uh, but uh, let's go to Haggai, chapter 2. If we can find them. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you no, do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled. You drink uh, with drink. You, uh, you clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And uh, let me see. No, I'm in wrong chapter. Uh, 2 verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, that they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will bring, give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so there's going to be a shaking of the nations. It's going to be a shaking of every nation. And, and you know, I don't know if, if this COVID thing is, is part of this, uh, but might be, it has definitely been shaking for people. People have lost their works and, and, and you know, and they have been feeling, the, you know, that the, 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 the system is not, you know, uh, all that strong and, and all that, you know, that we can put our faith in. No, so, so, but it says also that by the shaking, God will bring, you know, bring the nations to, uh, to the, the desires, the desire of all nations, which is Jesus. So, and, and what we see about COVID is, is probably not that result. So I think we're going to experience shakings coming. And, and, and that will bring the nations to God they will look to Jesus, look for the desires of all nations. And, and one thing that is, is, uh, is a big sign, you know, in the, in the end times, 
in the, in the, in the earth, in, in, the, in the world, is that lawlessness will take over. And, and in 2 Timothy, we probably read it, uh, you know, it says, you know, that it's going to be peril times, you know, when, when, when people are not, no longer, you know, loving God, but loving themselves and so on. And, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and lawlessness is going to be all over the place. And Jesus is saying the same in, in, uh, in Matthew 24. We can read there since we have been reading already in 2 Timothy. In, in uh, Matthew 24 and verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. People are loving themselves. And you know, the love on, in the families, love for each other is growing cold because lawlessness is abounding. And, and, and if you look in the world, this is what you see, you know. You see it so clearly that, that lawlessness is, is the, 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 the topic of the day, you know. Everything is allowed, everything. If you like to do it, you can do it. If you feel it's right, okay, then it's right. Might be not right for me, but it's right for you. And all this kind of crap. It's like every absolute is going to be taken away. So, so if I feel like I am today, I'm a man, and tomorrow I'm a woman, so then I go into the woman's bathroom, these things are just stupidity. But it's, it's, that has actually been law now in, in USA. They have taken this and made it law that there is no more sexes. It's what you feel. So, so it's like men's heads are being corrupted by this lawlessness. Nobody should t tell us how we should live. We should live just as we want. That is lawlessness. And Jesus is saying that lawlessness is going to abound in that time. So that is a major end time sign. And then in Matthew 20, Jesus is also giving another sign of the time before he comes. Matthew 20 and verse 6. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hires us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right you will receive. Okay, this of course is about uh, the wage that God is giving to, to all that is working in his vineyard. But also he says that in the 11th hour, you know, just before the end, there will be people standing idle. And I read, uh, actually I saw a documentary about, you know, they have this doomsday clock. That is a totally, you know, um, some science guys are, are having this. It doesn't have anything to do with God or something, but they, they call it the doomsday clock. And they actually said that we have put the doomsday clock two minutes closer to 12 because of um, artific artificial intelligence. And what they predict is that in the year of 2030, which is in nine years, there's going to be so much unemployment because of artificial intelligence. 
is taking over a lot of jobs. For instance, if you work in a bank in Norway, you are being replaced by robots because the robots are, you know, giving better loans easier, quicker than you can because they just follow all the rules and then they say yes or no to the loan of the customer. Or if you are doing accountant, it's, it's, you know, it's an easy thing to do in a way if you follow all the rules and they say, okay, a computer can do that. We don't need you here. And bus drivers, we do not need any bus drivers more. No, no, the bus are going to drive by itself. And there's a lot of these kind of occupations, you know, that is going to be changed into this artificial intelligence. And in the 11th hour, many are going to be idle. So that is also a sign of the time. And of course, Jesus says that it's going to, before the end of times, it's going to be as in the days of Noah and of Lot. How was it in the days of Noah and Lot? In the days of Noah, it says that there was a great violence in the earth. And they, they was eating, you know, they was, they was, you know, taking and, and, and uh, eating and drinking, it says, in, 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 in a negative way. Of course, everyone is eating and drinking, but this was, you know, like feasting upon, you know, this in, in an ungodly way. And also it said that they were giving and taking uh, into marriage. And, and of course, marriage is also a thing from God, but here is in an un ungodly way. Marriages that are not sanctified by God. Marriages that are not, you know, what God intended marriage to be. And you know, in the days of Lot, how was it in the days of Lot? It was an aggressive form of homosexual, uh, homosexual, uh, you know, uh, couldn't get my tongue to say it. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, when, when Lot got these angels on, on in, to visit in, in Sodoma, you know, the people of Sodoma or Gomorrah, I don't remember where, what city he was living in, but at least, you know, they came and, and, you know, demanded to get the angels to have sex with them. And, and, and you know, what we see now is this aggressive form of homosexuality, you know, where, where, where uh, you know, we have this pride and we have everything, you know, that is, is, is going on, you know. And so, so we are living in this kind of times that never before. In Norway, it was illegal to be a homosexual until 1979, I think it was. Now it is illegal to say that God is against this. You know, we had one priest. He was priest in, in a, a prison in Norway. And he got a question from a, from a journalist, I think it was, that asked, uh, what do you think God is thinking about, uh, uh, what, what do you think God is meaning about homosexuality? And he said that, the priest said, I think he doesn't, don't like it, which is, of course, very mild when you actually read that God is hating it. And, and from just by saying that, he got fired from the job. That shows how totally aggressive this thing is. And, and you know, we have all this cancel culture where, where, where people that is, is speaking out what God is saying, they are canceled from, from jobs, from, 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 from uh, TVs and stuff like that, you know. And, and, and all these things have to do with the end of times. We are in these times as in the days of Noah and on the days of Lot. Yeah. And, and you know, <clears throat> the spirit of the Antichrist is preparing for the mark of the beast. You know, we have all these, these things. Uh, we can read in, in, in Revelation 13. So 
soon going to end here now. Revelation 13 and verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number, uh, uh, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Uh, it says that there is a number of man. Uh, and, and that is the whole concept here. Antichrist, he is not coming like, you know, looking like the devil and saying, take this stamp in the forehead and you will forever get lost, but you will not be able to sell or buy without it. That's not how he's going to do it. No, it is the number of the man, of a man, which means that there is no, no obstacle in our flesh against it. It will be the most sure thing, the most you know, the, the smartest thing, it will be like, oh, this is so great. This, this fix everything, you know. That is how this mark is going to be. It's going to be no obstacle in us. And therefore, he is already preparing us into this moneyless society where we have our cards, you know, we have, in Norway, we have whips which is we, we buy with a phone, you know, and, 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 and we have Apple Pay, and, and there is a lot of things, you know, where we can pay without money. And therefore, when he is coming, the ground will be prepared. Everything will be, you know, the natural next step in the same way that we have been working all along. That doesn't mean that I'm against Visa card and stuff like that, but it is, you know, is a sign what time we are living in. If we went back 50 years, they did not know anything about this. It is something that is coming, have been coming the last years, and, and Antichrist, he is preparing for what is ahead. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of more here, but I, I will not take it all. But one thing is, in Isaiah, it says that fear and depression will come in front of the time when, when God is coming back. And, and now, I have, I'm working with youth. Uh, I'm, I'm a teacher in a high school, and I have had classes where half the class is going to psychologists. And, 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 and there is researchers, re, uh, um, like, you know, this kind of uh, uh, research that has seen, been looking into the young generation in Norway. And they have found out that from 2011, has gone from 15% of the young, uh, of the teenage girls that says they have symptoms of depression. Up till now in, in 2016 was the last one uh, where they say that over 20% now have it. That means one in five have symptoms, clear symptoms of depression among the, the young girls, teenage girls in our country. And, and, and this is how it is in a lot of countries. And, and this is actually a sign. If you read here in Isaiah uh, 24, 17 to 23, you will find that this is actually a sign of the time that we are living in. We should not take the time to read it, but, but it is 
very the evidence of the time are so clear. And let's go to Galatians 4. And we're going to soon stop now. If I get one more. Uh, Galatians 4 and verse 4. And there it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that he might receive the ab uh, adoption uh, as sons. So here it says that Jesus came in the fullness of time. And he will also come back in the fullness of time. It is that it's like it's God has been given Israel a, 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 a lot of pieces in the puzzle, and He has been giving the church a, a lot of pieces of the same puzzle, and then the world pieces of the puzzle. And then we have been sitting Israel by itself, and you know, making the the picture of the apostles, and the church is doing the same, and the world, you know. And when everything is put together as it's supposed to be, and they fit together, then Jesus is coming. When everything is in place that he has been speaking about. You know, Jesus came, and the first time he come, came, sorry, he fulfilled 300 Old Testament prophecies. They say actually that for a person to fulfill eight prophecies about himself, that is to, to do that either by coincidence or by will, it's a one million to one chance. And Jesus, he fulfilled 300 prophecies. And also, you know, he, one of them was that he was supposed to be born, you know, in Bethlehem, which he had no control over. He just got born on the right place because he was filling, fulfilling the prophecies that God, you know, he orchestrated everything so it should be like it was. And, you know, that is also how he's going to do when he comes back the second time. He's going to fulfill the rest of the prophecies. So everything will be perfect. And we see, you know, already that the pieces of the puzzle, they are starting to align, to, to get in place, you know. And, and when everything is there, the time, the fullness of time is there. And Jesus is coming back. So therefore, it's so important to look at the different signs, to see how, where we are in the time, in the timeline. And you know, let's just read in uh, Isaiah 60. And verse 19. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor the brightness shall the moon give light to you. The Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be ended. Also your people shall be righteous. Um, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. All this, you know, is about, if you, if you have read the end of Revelation, you will see that this is about the eternity, where, where the new Jerusalem is coming down, and there is no sun anymore, and God is the light. And then it says here, a little one shall become a thousand and a small one a strong nation. And then 
I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. So God is doing this in haste. What do you see when you look at the history of man from the creation and up until approximately 1900? There is, there is of course, some progress, you know, but not extremely much. It's like, yeah, they, they get the wheel, you know, they start to ride horses and stuff, and then, and then they start to, to ride, and, and the, you know, there is there's progress, but it's not extreme progress. But then, from 1900 and up till now, there is an explosion. It's like, in, in the 1900s, in, in, in the United Kingdom, they said, okay, now it's time to just to close down the office of uh, where we, where we uh, uh, make patents, you know, uh, patents. Uh, because no, everything must be discovered. Everything that has, is going to be made is made, they said in the 1900s. How wrong they were. It's like all that we do to everything that we have now is, is, is something that has been made from the 1900s up, up to now. And you know, it's, 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 it's the, the, the pace of everything is changing so rapidly. So that when they said in, in the 1950s, a product had like, ter- like 20 to 30 years of lifetime before they had to change it, you know. But now it's like two years, and then you have to change it because it's like nobody wants it because it's old-fashioned or whatever. And that is, 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 it's like somebody has been pushing down the the, 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 the speed on the car, you know. It's like everything is happening so fast. And that is exactly what God is saying here. I, the Lord will hasten it in its time. God is doing this in haste. He has pushed the button and everything is happening at a very, very quick pace. So, what do we do in this time? Is this a message to create fear? By no means at all. In Luke 21 it says, in verse 28, Know when these things begin to happen. Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption's redemption draws near. This is a message of hope. Jesus is coming back and we are going to be a glorious church. We are going to stand in the middle of a great harvest. And we're going to see God is doing what he said from the beginning. And every obstacle is going to be removed. And he is going to reign forever and ever. And we're going to reign with him. That is what's laying ahead. And the signs are there. So when we now see these things happen, and they are happening around us, then it's time for us to lift our head, to start to, 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 to expect him, to, to welcome him, and, and you know, to have this, this longing in our hearts after him. We are supposed to be this bride, you know, the bride that is waiting for the groom. And, and you know, he, a, a bride is not you know, sleeping when the, when the wedding is happening. No, she is making herself ready. You know, my wife, she, she went to the hairdresser, you know, and made her makeup perfect, the dress was perfect, and everything was perfect. And you know, a, a woman, you know, had been dreaming the whole life for the wedding, you know. We, my, we men, it's, it's, it's not like that. You know, we, we, you know, if somebody would oversleep in the wedding, it would probably be the man, uh, but never the wife. She, you know, have been dreaming for this, preparing for this whole life, you know. And then the big day is there, and she, 
so ready. And, and that is also how we're supposed to be. We are this bride, you know, we are the bride of Christ. And we're going to expect him and be ready and we be clothed in, in all the glory of God. That is how we're going to do in these coming years. So, Father God, I just pray for each and every one. I just pray that you m- let us see the times that are, we are living in. Let us be awake and sober in this time and ready for battle and ready for you when you come. Let everyone just be, be clothed in, in, in all your glory and grow up into this church of glory that you are preparing for yourself. And I just pray that, that we, we are going to be this, this, this force in the earth that is going to see the, the great harvest time so that we can see, start to, 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 to bring in the harvest that you have prepared. And, and, and just pray, Father, that you anoint each and every one and just fill them up with hope for the future. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you. Next time we're going to look at, at uh, the, the, the rapture and, and, and what God's word is saying about that. And, and so stay tuned next Wednesday and then we continue. So God bless you and have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen.